I just want to make a personal statement. I was asked when I got in last night, so have you ever been to Jamaica before? And I said, yeah, I've been many times to the North Coast. The last time I was in Kingston, I was a young boy. Uh, a young, very young boy, because uh, uh, my father uh, was brought down here by the University of West Indies, the Jamaican government, and UNESCO to talk all around the Caribbean about adult education. My father was a professor at the University of Chicago, coined the phrase lifelong learning in regard as the father of adult education. So I'm perhaps the only person in the room that can remember flying all over the Caribbean in a DC-3. So, so when Claire reached out to me about seven months ago with this vision that I just heard a bulldog, I'm gonna make this happen, I offered up my services because for me it was very symmetrical to come back to a place that I remember as a young child where my father tried to make a difference in the Caribbean. And so what I want to, and I'm a futurist, and I define that as being a catalyst to get people, companies, governments, and the world to think about the future and then to facilitate a conversation about it. This morning I may not have time to facilitate a conversation about it unless we find some time for Q&A, and I love Q&A. So that's what I'm here to do. Now this presentation, this first part is very high level. I want to explain what is going on around the world. So the, when I use the pronoun we for the first part of this, I'm talking about humanity. Then I'm gonna get specific into the technologies and the concepts and the dynamics that I think uh, you should know about. And then finally into a focus on what I think uh, Jamaica should be working on and thinking on between now and 2030. So first of all, we've entered the shift age. And everybody in this room is the latest iteration of humanity. We're called modern humanity. We have been around 150,000 years. And then 10,000 years ago, we literally put down roots and the agricultural age began. And if you think of those 10,000 years, that's when all the great civilizations of the world and all the great religions were created. So it's recorded history. And then about 300 years ago, the introduction of the steam engine in the marketplace, the industrial age began. So we all feel change today. To put change in perspective, if a lifetime is 50 years, and if you just heard, we certainly live longer than that now, but centuries and millennia ago we didn't. If a lifetime is 50 years, then 150,000 years, modern humanity's time on the planet, is 3,000 lifetimes. 10,000 years is 200 lifetimes. So for the 3,000 lifetimes that we have been on this planet, Literally 2,800 of them we lived in caves or we lived nomadically. 200 of them we created all the great civilizations and religions of the world. Six of them we created all the wonders in the industrial age. And only in our lifetime have we created the information age. So uh, now we are in the shift age. That's an arbitrary date. An age usually takes a, a, about a decade to come in. And for those of you that don't understand the concept of ages, it's not like one stops and the other begins. It's an evolutionary iteration of, of, of social evolution so that, so that, you know, 10 miles from where I'm standing right now, somebody's growing something, somebody's manufacturing something, somebody's in a wired office. So uh, it was about 2005, and I've read all the great futures from the last century, McLuhan, Toffler, Fuller, and, and uh, and I knew something new was gonna happen. Because from the vantage point of 2005, I looked back and the information age got its name in the 70s. So from the vantage point of 2005, what had happened since the 70s? The end of the Cold War, the beginning of the global economy, personal computing, the internet and cell phones. And just those five things alone would necessitate a new age being created. So then I started thinking, okay, well, so what is gonna happen in this new century, in the first third of this new century. And I realized that it was much beyond the definition of a product as the prior ages indicated. It was about shift. Everything was gonna undergo some amount of shift and some rate of shift. So I came up with the name, um, the shift age. And then I started to think, well, every age has its own characteristics and dynamics. And so what are the forces of the shift age that will be underlying all the change and all the significance of this age. And I got it down to three. And if I, I submit to you that if you think this afternoon, this week, next month, about the, eight, about the changes going on in your life, you can probably trace them back to one of these three forces. So the first force is this flow to global. Clearly we're in a global economy, but it's much more than that. We're getting involved in a, in a global construct, but 
Most importantly, we are in the global stage of human evolution. We've gone from family to tribe to city, to village to city, to city state, to nation state, and our only remaining boundaries for now are planetary. So we're in the global stage of human evolution. So that's the flow to the global. At the same time, is the flow to the individual. Everybody in this room is more powerful as an individual than individuals have ever been before. And the reason this happened is in the developed countries of the world, there's been an explosion of choice. More brands of toothpaste, more brands of cars, certainly more brands of cereal, more way to watch video, more way to listen to music. And when there's an explosion of choice, the power moves from the producer to the consumer, from the institution to the individual. Now, to give you an example, I write a blog and I do newsletters. And when I upload it from whatever hotel room I'm in, people from 43 countries read my blog. I mean, that's very powerful for me because I can reach the world. 20 years ago, I'd have to be part of a, of a news developing organization. Now, both of these forces, the flow to the global and the flow to the individual, are powered by the single most significant force in the planet today, the accelerating electronic connectedness of the planet. Now, you know, it, it, is, it is perhaps one of the two or three most in human history. And, and it is, you might say initially it's about the internet, and it's not. It's about this device, the cell phone. So we've entered the shift age. Currently, there's 7.3 billion people. Probably by the end of next year, it'll be 7.4 billion. 6.1 billion of them have cell phones. Think about that. That's cell phone ubiquity. There are more people who have cell phones. A higher percent of the pop world's population has cell phones than have running water or electricity in their homes. Now, what does that mean? It means that um, if I were to call the minister here on his cell phone, I'm not going to, I don't have your number, you know, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, five seconds, your phone would ring, right? If I were to call, uh, you know, some of the people I know in China, maybe 12,000 miles away, it might be another two seconds because of the relay of the satellite. So what cell phone ubiquity means is the difference between 15 meters and 12,000 miles is two seconds. So there's no time or distance limiting human communication. That's the world we live in now. Now, question to the room, and I know you're invited guests, and you're all very intelligent and very dynamic. I have never gotten the wrong answer in the 700 times I've asked this question, okay? So don't let me down. Now, if you're on a cell phone to cell phone conversation after, hey, how you doing? Or in the United States and perhaps here, can you hear me okay? What's one of the next questions you ask cell phone to cell phone conversation? What? Where are you? Exactly right. So there is no time, distance, or place any longer limiting human communication. So in one of the most significant things that we as humans do, communicate, place is increasingly irrelevant. And that's very significant for Jamaica. For, though Jamaica is a wonderful place, you can be in Jamaica and do business all the way around the world. It doesn't matter, okay? Now the other thing I should mention, I mean this happens to be an iPhone, Six plus, I like the big screen. I've got more computing power in my hand than Apollo 13. We, collectively in this room, have more computing power than NASA had when John Glenn orbited the planet. So not only is there no time, distance, or place limiting human communication, there is more distributed computing power in the world today in the hands of individuals than ever before. By the end of 2016, more than half, of probably 6.2 billion at that point, will have smartphones. Xiaomi and Huawei, uh, Chinese companies, are coming out with uh, phones for half the price of, of what you pay for a phone in the United States, okay? So, so you have distributed computing power. So what does this mean? It means that we live in a broadband world. I use the phrase broadband versus high-speed because it connotes pipe with content going through it. So what does that mean for all of us? It means we have two realities. We have the physical reality and the screen reality. Physical realities based on atoms, screen realities based on digits. 
So because the screen reality is based on digits, it morphs much more quickly than the physical reality. So relative to comments made before I got up here on the stage, you cannot look to the future based on your perception of the physical reality as it exists today. Now, when I started talking about this 2007, 2008, it was kind of hard to figure out. I used an example for the United States because I obviously know it much better than Jamaica. So why over here in the physical reality are malls closing all across the United States? or big box stores closing, or strip centers you know, uh, for sale for rent and Borders has gone out of business. Because over here, there's something on the screen reality called Amazon.com, right? So something on the screen reality, Amazon.com, is completely reshaping physical retail in the United States of America. In fact, it is the most transformative time of physical retail in the United States since the invention of the automobile. So, so the change is coming through the screen. So you have two realities, the reality of sitting in this room and listening to me right now, or checking your screen reality for the reality of the rest of your life. And that's a very significant thing. So what does that mean? It means disintermediation. This is not a word you can find in the dictionary. Back about 2006, if you typed in disintermediation, you get my name because I was using it the most. The root word of disintermediation is intermediary. So disintermediation means removal of the intermediary, removal of the middleman. Internet 1.0, stock brokerage industry, travel industry, Internet 2.0, everything. So when I speak to CEOs and groups of CEOs in the United States, I say, if you are a middleman, if you are a distributor, you have two choices. You either drop your price and become a commodity business, which no business wants to do because you're basing your business entirely on price, or you add value you add, and you gain trust. So the, so the product in the shift age is adding value, adding knowledge, and gaining trust. So that's important. The important thing is if you are selling, you don't sell a product. You add value to your potential customer until they want to buy. You give them knowledge and educate them until they want to buy, and you develop a level of trust. So this is what is going on in the shift age. Now, remember 1999? Does anybody remember 1999? What are you going to do for New Year's Eve? Remember that? Right? Because it's the new millennium. Well, of course it wasn't the new millennium, because the new millennium was 2000, 2001, because 2000 was the last year of the second millennium, but because we're all so odometer-oriented, we figured, okay, this is the new millennium. Remember Y2K, right? <laughs> well, the same thing happened in 2009. The latter part of December in 2009, I was on a writing retreat in one of the places I live in Florida, and whenever I went to mainstream media, you know, December 15th, December 31st, 2009, what's this new decade going to be? And of course, the thought balloon over my head was, it's not the new decade, that's 2010, but because I'm a futurist and I wanted to get ahead of the parade, I decided I would name the decade. So on Friday, January 1st, 01, 01, 10, interesting digital date, I called it the transformation decade. And more than any other blog post uh, I've written, it blew up all around the world. It was a weekend, so all through Saturday and Sunday, you know, from Berlin to Beijing to, to Rio, who calls it the transformation decade? This is the dictionary definition of transformation. A change in form, appearance, nature, or character. So since 2010, I've been saying to CEOs or the Fortune 500 companies for whom I've done corporate retreats, if you are not in the business of changing the nature, shape, character, and form of your company, of your country, certainly for your business, you may not have a business by 2020, or you will be surpassed as a country by 2020. So this is the decade where it all changes. Now we're halfway through it, 2015 but we're not halfway through the change because change, speed of change is sped up so that it's environmental. So the amount of change that we all collectively will experience between now and 2020 is probably twice the amount of change we've experienced since 2010. Take your mind back to where you were in 2010, what kind of phone you were using, what kind of business you were using, or, uh, business you were doing. So 
This leads to the collapse of legacy thinking. Now, as a futurist, when I travel around the world, this is what I see. Everybody in this room has legacy thinking. I try to have it the least because I've trained myself. Legacy thinking is thought from the past. If you're over the age of 40, you've spent the majority of your life in the 20th century where your thought was formed. Or you were told things, dad always said, or my business mentor in 1995 said, if you haven't taken those truisms and washed them through the filter of 2015, you may not be able to see 2015 clearly. So you have to let go, legacy thinking, transportation, energy, communication, education. What, what we around the world are being held back by is our own legacy thinking. Well, this is the way it is, and we have to change it to the way it's going to be, but we always see through the filter of where we are. This is what is happening all around the world. Everything is collapsing in terms of the way it used to be, 20th century. You know, it's like the, the, the governments of the world, and certainly businesses of the world, the developed countries of the world, have powered into the 21st century with the 20th century thought. You know, like in Washington, for example. Oh, well, let's go back and try this. It worked under Reagan. Wah, can't do that, right? There was a Cold War. There wasn't a global economy, right? So, you know, whenever, you look, whenever anybody says, well, let's go back to, they're locked into their own legacy thinking. So now that legacy thinking is collapsing, it creates a space. And what is filling that space? This. This is the first decade of 21st century thought. This is the decade of where we have to start thinking about the future. I've written a book about the future of healthcare. So when I talk to healthcare or, uh, conferences, I say, what does 21st century healthcare look like? Or education conferences, what does 21st century education look like? If I were to say 20th century to you, or 20th century, whatever comes to mind, the American century, century of World War, century of science, it began 1914 to 1918. World War I, Russian Revolution, general theory of relativity, the map of Europe as it largely is, and very unfortunately, the map of the Middle East as the Europeans define it with these arbitrary straight lines and right, ang right angles in the middle of the desert. So all the storylines of the last hundred years began with the second decade of the last century. I think future historians, 2100, 2150, whatever, can look back and go, this is the decade that humanity started thinking 21st century thought. So the highest level thought that you as a country and as an island nation need to answer is what is Jamaica for the 21st century? Anything less than that is being stuck to the past. I mean, Bob Marley will always be great, right? Beaches may or may not be so great. So what is Jamaica for the 21st century? The people, right, exactly. The people in this room have to answer that question collectively. And anyway, I can help, and people you know can help. That's the critical question. Too many other countries and a lot of companies are not asking that big a question of themselves. So now, with all this said, let's take a look as the of the future in this shift age. Now, I'm going to put both of these up and give an explanation. I do not know the exact current demographics of Jamaica, but these are two of the generations of the shift age. The millennials, birth year, 1981, 1997. Digital natives, 1998 in the United States, maybe a little bit, maybe 2000 here. In the United States, of course, I'm obviously a baby boomer. The first thing I have to say is up through the birth year 2014, these two generations together we're f are five million larger than the baby boom. So as the baby boom has been the, the pig in the python, you know, it's all about us, 60s was rebellion, now it's about aging. This is the future of the world. 
Now, I've spoken on all six continents, 14 countries, and I can tell you emphatically that millennials are more like each other around the world than they are like their parents' generation. Whether it's Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Brazil, they're much different. So the millennials are the leaders of the shift age. There will be a millennial president in 2028 or 2032 in the United States, for example. They will be the leaders. They are much more collaborative. They are much more technically connected. They want to change the world. By 2010 to 2011, there was always this issue in the workplace in the United States, all oh, these entitled millennials, you know, they come into work with these buds in their ear and they want to leave at five o'clock on Friday to have a hang out with their friends and lead a balanced life. What is that about? I was a boomer, I worked forever, right? It's not that they're entitled, it's that they want to change the world and if they can't change it with working with you, Mr. CEO, they're gonna go someplace else. Between now and 2025 in the world, it's certainly in the developed countries and absolutely in the United States of America. There is a greater generational shift in power, money, influence, and authority between now and 2025 than in human history. The millennials, it is their time and their ascendant. The digital natives I find much more fascinating. Why are they digital natives? Because they are the first generation born into the digital landscape. For them, it's their native land. Everybody in this room, myself included, is a digital immigrant, okay? If you've never thought of yourself as an immigrant, this is your time, right? Because we got our stuff when we're an adult. You and I, sir, got our cell phones as an adult, got our first computer as an adult, used the first fax machine as an adult. They've born, born into it. If, is anybody, so anybody have a, a child of, say, 13 or 14? Right, raise your hand, anybody? Boy or girl? Boys. boys, okay. So it's school night, right? And you want to see if your boys are doing their homework. So you go up and you knock on their door, say, and you open the door and you kind of go, certainly in the United States, oh, what, Dad? And they take off their earphones and they put the TV on mute and they take their hands off their cell phone and laptop and say, what, Dad? And you kind of go, well, I just want to check and see if you're doing your homework, right? Because there's no way that you think they could possibly do their homework with all the stuff going on, right? But they can, right? There's been studies that have shown that in the digital native's brain, there is 3 to 6% more synaptic activity going on than the brain of anybody in this room because they've been born into the information overloaded society. They are the first generation to ask the question that's been in the zeitgeist ever since the invention of the computer, can human physiology keep up with technological, the rapidity of technological speed? These folks can. They will grow up and have a new consciousness. If you think of anybody born since 2009, what has happened since 2009? 2G, 3G, 4G, touch screens. They have no duality between book and ebook, DVD versus streaming. It's all on the screen they will lead us into a new consciousness in the 2020s and 2030s. Now, society and economics, here's some high-level points. I'm glad you mentioned design. We are in the golden age of design. Everything has to be either designed or redesigned. Design used to be in the arts, and then in the 1800s, Hausmann redesigned Paris, and then in the 1900s, people like Raymond Lowy, industrial design. Now, Disney, a great company, right? What do people call it? What, how do they talk about it? The Disney experience. So even experience needs to be designed. I think that's one of the futures of Jamaica, by the way, is to create this thing called the Jamaica experience, not just you know, the music and the beach, but the Jamaica experience, man, right? You know? I mean, literally, in the United, the word America, the word America is an idea. That's why people want to come to it. And in the Western Hemisphere, Brazil and Jamaica are the two countries that if you say something, a culture immediately comes to mind. That is a great advantage that you have, right? So, so everything has to be, energy has to be redesigned, transportation has to be redesigned, communication has to be redesigned, healthcare has to be redesigned. So we are in the golden age of design. You cannot have any change in government direction future between now and 2030 without fully incorporating design, right? 
Steve Jobs was named the, the uh, CEO of the decade, 2000 to 2010, and he was a designer, right? Apple has won because of its design. The rapidity of social change. I do not know the intricacies of this in your country, but when I speak in the United States, here's what I say. I say, tell me what, remember what you thought about gay marriage in 2008. Whatever you thought, it was against your religion, kind of weird if you weren't gay. And if you were like any one of the three people who could have become president in 2008, Obama, Clinton, or McCain, you were dead set against it. Now it's the law of the land in the United States. If you'd asked me, even a futurist in the year 2000, you think gay marriage is going to be legal? I'll go, not in the United States, right? The next thing is marijuana. Marijuana is going to be legal. It is legal in 25 states, two-thirds of the population. Right, exactly. You should do this. I mean, I got all kinds of grief. You know, you can go to my website, davidhool.com. I have all my forecasts, what I said, when I said it. In the September 2010, I said, by the middle of this decade, marijuana will be largely decriminalized in the United States of America. The, pres the person who becomes president of the United States next year will not be able to avoid this question because the states have already spoken, right? So the rapidity of social change, you're going to experience that yourself. The population is changing more quickly than the laws from the past, the legacy laws state. Investing in politics. When I wrote the book upon which this presentation was made in 2012, I said that there would be high volatility in investment and economics in the middle part of this decade. Why? Because you come into the decade with traditional metrics of measurement, earnings per share per quarter, and then something like 19 billion for WhatsApp and 2 billion for Oculus Rift. What is that? So, so, you know, right now it's like the, the market doesn't have anything to do with traditional metrics. It's in reactive mode to things that are going on in the world. I think by the end of this decade, there'll be some more integration in terms of what things are valued, so there'll be much more stability. But the, the volatility in the commodity markets and in the equity markets has been no surprise to me. I happen to be in China the last two weeks in, in August, and it was really funny because I spoke to the number one wealth management company in, in China on a Thursday. Their Shanghai had gone, the index had gone down, right at that point it was 3480. First question they asked me, what do you think it's gonna be? I said it's gonna be 3000. Oh no, it can't be 3000. The following Tuesday, it broke 3000, right? So because of this volatility, the good news I was saying 2018, I think it's going to be 2019, we will have the first global bull market in the planet. All past bull markets have been centered around national economies, but now that we're getting ever more integrated, when this new stage of the uh, 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 global economy I'm about ready to talk about takes off, it will be a global bull market. So, so part of what will give you a lift is that going into the 2020s, right? Cities and urbanization. Okay, 53% of all humans live in an urban environment today. So 53% is 7.3 billion. All the projections show 70% by the 2040s. That's a 40% increase, okay? 40% increase in the number of people living in cities. But the other correlative data that you need to know is that by then we will be at 9 billion. 70% of 9 billion means that from 2015 to 2045, 30 years, there will be 2.6 billion more people living in cities than live in cities today. The math, as you said, have done the math, 75 million people a year moving to cities. That's astounding. 100,000 people a month are moving into cities in Asia this year alone. Now most of this is Asia and to some degree Africa, but certainly uh, Kingston will be 50% larger. And how do you deal with that? So, okay, <laughs> I didn't know that was a, uh, a laugh line, okay. Um, so the future, the future of humanity and the future of cities is very congruent. 
I disagree with what was suggested here. I think we have new and entered a new age of lower energy costs. Now, Good. Well, then you're with me. The, the current blog, you can go to my website, 2015 will be the peak year of fossil fuel consumption. It's going down. There's all these trends. I can talk about it. What put me on the map the first time in 2006, when oil was $50 a barrel, I said that oil would be $125 a barrel by 2008. In 2007, I was laughed off of the National Syndicated Business Show in the United States because, oh, this futurist, I was asked the question, what's oil going to be by the end of 2007? I said, somewhere around $90 to $100 a barrel. <laughs> now let's talk to the, the oil analyst. Oh, it'll be about 50 bucks. So I got that right, and I've been right about the price of oil ever since. Pretty much $90 to $120 a barrel. At the beginning of last year, 2014, I said there'll be lower pressure on that, that oil could go down to the $70 mark. Obviously, it went down to the 40s. I didn't know that Saudi Arabia was going to go for market share, and they did. We will never have $100 barrel of oil again. Absolutely. It's great news. And at the same time, in the last seven years, solar and wind have come down so they are the same cost relative to conversion to electricity as fossil fuels. They absolutely are. So the reason not to go immediately to renewable energy is laziness or lack of vision. It's that simple. The price is now the same. Absolutely. So there, you know, there should not be, and, and what, the, and, and there should not be anything. And, and also, the, the cars we drive are more efficient. We're going to electric cars. So all these things are going to bring down the cost of energy. So for an island nation, that is very significant. Right now, a larger island nation, same population, New Zealand, is 80 to 85 percent renewable energy. If you think about, well, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but the, the second stage of the global economy has begun. The first stage, 89, 2014, everybody got in the game, right? I got a suit. It's a great microfiber travel suit. It's made in Vietnam. 20 years ago, I went about a suit made in Vietnam. Now everybody's into it. The next stage which we've entered is much more integrative. It is getting ever more connected. This is something that an island nation needs to think about. You are no longer an island nation. You are part of the world. Okay? You are part of the global economy in ways that you could not have been even 10 years ago. Now, I'm going to put up some economic trends. And there have dates. These are trends I first noticed in the United States, and they are definitely happening in all the developed countries of the world. The first is thrift is the new cool. Because of Amazon, because of things, nobody buys stuff that isn't on sale. In the United States, since the Great Recession began, the number of thrift shops in the United States, or secondhand stores, has doubled. Millennials are not materialistic. They want good connectivity to stay in touch with their friends, and they're much more experiential than they are materialistic. Again, plays to your advantage, because this is an experience to come to Jamaica. It's not to come and buy a product. It's to have a life experience. Less is more. Baby boomers, downsizing. Millennials, not materialistic. Houses will get smaller. Zero carbon footprint. Cars are getting smaller. Everything. Less is more. I walked into my apartment, which I no longer have in Chicago, uh, and it was like 1,200 square feet. And, I, and uh, a little bit more. If you take away the kitchen and the two bathrooms, basically it was a place that I kept my stuff. I had my books, my records, my CDs, my DDs. Now that's all digital in one terabyte, right? So, you know. The digitization means smaller. You can increase the population and not have the type of problems of housing we have today. Housing will change. And, and I first said this in the United States about real estate, but it is true across our culture. As a baby boomer, I was told, buy real estate, always go up in value. No longer the clay, case. Climate change, aging population, nobody, to, the, the uh, millennials, can't buy because they got all the student debt because their parents said, don't worry about it, you know. Uh, we'll take out a second mortgage on the home. Now it's underwater, right? 
but it, now it's everything. You don't need to buy a DVD. You stream with Netflix. You don't even need to buy MP3. You stream with Spotify. You, it, it, if you are an Amazon Prime member, I get 100,000 books a month I can read for free, right? So everything is going to a subscription model. The concept of having to own things is going away because everything is rentable or leasable. And finally, conscious capitalism, double bottom line. A millennial is going to look to you, um, or someone's going to look to you and go, what does your company stand for? Are you increasing greenness in Jamaica? Are you increasing clean water in Africa? What do you stand for? Because I need to know that if I give you my money, you have a vision of changing the world. This is absolutely going on in developed countries. It's the double bottom line. Not, I'm going to give one-tenth of one percent to the charity. Anybody hear of Tom's Shoes? Yeah. yeah, okay. Buy one pair of shoes, and we give a pair of shoes to a child in a poor country. I teach, I'm the futurist in residence and guest lecturer at the Ringling College of Art and Design, so I talk to some of the most talented 18 to 23-year-olds, and half of them have Tom shoes, wear them, and have the logo, because that's important to them, okay? Now, era of big data, it's one of the most significant developments in the shift age. Think of it, you know, everyone talks about it, what is big data, you know, it's been talked about too much, people dressed in black like me, so I'm not talking about it, right? Um, it's the third stage of human mapping. First stage, what does this island look like? Second stage, how do we transverse the island? The third stage is big data, human behavior. It is real-time anthropology and sociology. There is more data being created in this room right now, even if your cell phone is off, than was created in Jamaica in 1980. Okay, it's kind of like we are in data waves, we're completely submerged. We all know that there's television waves, radio waves, cellular waves going through this room. It's data waves. When a CEO says, well, last year my numbers were, I go, what, what were your numbers last night? Because you should know, right? It's all connected, everything is known. It is a data-driven world, okay? What the problem with data is there's so much data, so relative to the design comment. So I mentioned I'm at the Ringling College of Art and Design. These are creatives. Starting in 2012, the CIA hired one of the graduates. Now, the intelligence community is one of the largest sectors that is coming to Ringling to get design students. And I sat down with Larry Thompson, the president, and I said, I mean, dumb me, I didn't obviously get it. And he said, there is so much data clearly coming into the intelligence community around the world that they need artists to graphically represent the data so you can see the flows and the dynamics and where the information is coming from, where it's going, because you can't make a decision unless you can understand the data, which is what this man right before me was saying. You know, people ask me as a future, what kind of education should my child get? I said, get a generalist education. You know, when I graduated from college, I was told, you're going to have five jobs in your lifetime, unlike my parents who had one. Now people are being educated and saying, you're going to have five or six careers, three of which don't exist now. So the only way you can educate people is to prepare them for something that we don't know what it is. And having general knowledge is much better than having an accounting degree, okay? Now, I was asked to talk about technology. Some of these technologies I put up are not necessarily for Jamaica, but these are the technologies that are happening certainly in Silicon Valley in the United States and certainly in Europe. Um, and th there will be billions of dollars made on these technologies between now and 2020. Obviously, 3D printing and custom manufacturing. The whole concept of manufacturing will change. Henry Ford defined it as mass. Now it's going to be custom. Augmented and virtual reality, huge. Remember the screen reality? And the physical reality, augmented reality, merges the two so you have the experience at the same time. Virtual reality will change every single game, uh, medicine, education, gaming, everything. Bionics and robotics. Bionics is stuff that goes in our body. Uh, the exoskeletal suit, right? That is now in production where somebody who is a quadriplegic can walk. 
pretty astounding. And all this stuff about aging, which you touched on so, so accurately, that's what robotics, what am I doing? What's wrong here? We're okay? Okay. Um, robotics, that's one of the things they are going to help elderly people. Voice recognition and translation software. I was saying to somebody last night, you know, I was in Shanghai um, a couple months ago. You don't need to learn a foreign language unless you want to learn it because it stimulates a certain part of your brain, you know? Excuse me, could you tell me how I could get to the Apple store in Shanghai? Ding, 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 <laughs> Apple. Uh, okay, thanks, right? That simple. Brainwave computer interface. If you think about it, we interact with computers, voice, and touch. Brainwave is next. There is successful research going on where thought translates into computer action. Now, this may not be something for the sound, but this is happening now. Of the future, this is huge. I'll talk about it in a minute. Atmospheric cleansing. Alternative and renewable energy is the greatest wealth creation opportunity in human history. All right? It's the first time that five to six billion people have to replace a product they're using. So again, alternative renewable energy is the single greatest wealth creation opportunity in human history. And whoever invents the ability to extract CO2, I'll talk about it in a minute, from the atmosphere will have un imaginable wealth. And it is going on. I have a website, uh, Future Wow, and I, and I featured it recently. There's a guy in Rotterdam who, through Kickstarter, raised some money, put up like a two-story tower. So in an area twice the size of this room, it stands there. It's in Rotterdam, and it cleans out all the CO2 and all the particulates around it. That's a way to place by place by place solve pollution, which, by the way, pollution kills more people every year than all the cancers combined. Holographic communications device. We talk about, oh, you want to have a video meeting? It will be holographic. That's the next iteration. I mean, everybody has a smartphone now that you can't even use all the features that are already on it. I understand that, <laughs> right? Uh, but but it, will, it, will, it will go to holographic. Second generation virtual reality. This is where 1984 and everything um, changes because the, the first generation, 2016, will be known as the year of virtual reality, uh, certainly in the United States. You know, where, where you, I, 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 I keynoted in April in Australia, and so I was the future, so everybody wanted to show me their virtual reality stuff. And I remember a couple of them when I put them on, and the experience I had for the two minutes I had it on is as real as the experiences I had physically in Australia. So now the next stage is they're going to incorporate the sense of smell and the sense of taste, which are the two senses that trigger memory. And when they have that, by 2020, 20, between 2020 and 2025, you will be able to come home. And I mean, virtual reality could be a big deal here because anywhere in the world you could recreate the Jamaica experience. Now, to be a little almost, uh, almost off color, you know, if you start thinking of the peripherals you can put on, you won't know whether it was real or whether it wasn't real, okay? So this is really significant. It's also where, where governments could control the people. It's also where people could be, people, you know, can travel widely and never leave their home. So this is a real moral thing. Collective consciousness interface technology. When I started my blog in 2006, I called it Evolution Shift. Because people always say to me, oh, so you're future. So you talk about the future of technology. And I say, no, I don't talk about the future of technology. I talk about how humanity changes because of technology. And I see us living, we are the first iteration. Remember I said time, and, time distance, and place has gone away in communication? We are the first iteration of humanity to live in a spatial context. It was 165 years ago that the telegraph was invented. So 170 years ago, the speed of human communication was a horse day, how far a horse could go in a day. Now something happens. I was up late last night because I saw that there was this huge electoral victory in Canada. I wouldn't have known about that for a couple of days, right? But the point is, so we're getting all connected. So I really believe that there's going to be an evolutionary shift. We, we live in a spatial context. And if you think of those digital natives and how they're growing up, grandma's two keystrokes away. 
The world's knowledge is three keystrokes away. That's going to change consciousness. And it is already being done in universities in the United States where somebody is sitting here playing a video game and they have to make a decision and they know what the decision is. It's A or B. And somebody across campus who's wearing the same headset picks the right answer. This is already happening. Okay, shift age energy. New era of lower costs, how long? I think it's going to go on for years. It could be for the next decade. This is a great time to completely go to, to renewable uh, energy. Um, I was rereading, uh, well, hold on. This was the breakthrough. I've been saying for years, as soon as we get store battery technology up to speed, it will trigger a revolution. If you think of 1900 to 2000, all the great technological change, battery didn't change hardly at all, right? Thank God for my new hero, Elon Musk. Elon Musk created the power pack. And I don't know if all of you saw that. Of course, he's changing automotive with the Tesla. Tesla power, right? You can buy a beautiful thing about the size of that speaker that mounts on your wall that stores alternative and renewable energy. Because alter re renewable energy has the problem. If it's cloudy, if it's no windy, but on a sunny day, it stores it. One per household gives you a week worth of storage. He announced it, in, and he came up with a big one called the Power Rack for utilities and big companies. He announced it, not ready to take orders, and he got a billion dollars worth of orders in two months. Okay? He's building a gigafactory in, New, in Nevada, right? It, 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 a giga because it's huge. He is going to make annually as, men, as many of these batteries for his cars and for, for Tesla energy as exist in the world today, right? And it's completely powered by wind and solar. So he's making the stuff with wind and solar. So your manufacturing over the next 15 years by 2030 could be completely powered by renewable. Okay, and, and, and this is an island country of variable weather, but largely sun. This solves the problem. Distributed energy, talking about the grid. Distributed energy, also direct current. Because the problem in a cyber world is that sometime, somewhere, not too soon from now, there will be a cyber attack that will take down an electrical grid. It's going to happen, right? So the, the alternative to that is to have distributed energy. If everybody has their own energy source, everybody can keep moving on. A global systems approach. The world has to have a global systems approach. There will be countries in the world that will take 20 years to get off of fossil fuels. There are countries in the world like Denmark and New Zealand, they're going to be off it in five years. So we have to look at it globally because there is nobody who is not downwind or downstream from somebody today. The new era of the automobile. This is what I'm writing about. Think about what is about to happen with automobiles. We are going from hardware to software, driver to driverless, fossil fuels to electric. Total transformation. By the way, Apple has 600 people working on a car. By the way, Apple has more money in its bank account than the combined market caps of Ford and General Motors. So you want to talk about a seminal change, you're going to have Google and Apple as dominant cars. Uber is doing driverless cars. So by 2030, in the United States, at least a third of the cars in the United States will not have drivers. You know, drivers are the most dangerous part of the vehicle, right? <laughs> well, they are, right? Google has done 2 million miles, 2 million miles on, uh, on the roads, 17 accidents, all, all caused by the driver. This is one thing I want to talk about real briefly, because it's in my mind. I have a book. I wanted to have it out so I could give it all to you today. I'm going to give it, I'm going to, give it to you, and I give it to you, Dan, and you can disseminate it. It's called This Spaceship Earth. I'm also setting up a global nonprofit, thisspaceshipearth.org. The concept is simple. Marshall McLuhan, there are no passengers in Spaceship Earth, we are all crew. The purpose of my nonprofit is to get us all think as crew. You know, you have an advantage because you're an island nation. We have a, my, my co-author has as an image the picture of the Earth rise over the moon. And he says, Earth, the ultimate in island living, right? 
Who is going to resupply Spaceship Earth? Nobody. So that's very significant. So Jamaica, real quickly, 20 to 21st industry development. You have to embrace 21st century. Don't just think that bauxite is the answer, OK? That's 20th century. You have to think 21st century. Transform education for 21st century. The fastest growing phenomenon in K through 12 schools in the United States is coding. And Diane told me about this wonderful thing you were doing with women, right? Coding. People, this is a beautiful place to live and work. In a globally connected environment, you can build 21st century industry that is all computer coding or creativity and send it to the world. Because people like me and other people want to live in nice places because I can connect to the world. It's very significant. Thank you. Further brand development. Again, what I said, you in Brazil. When you say Jamaica around the world, People have an image. They have a sense. They will say one of the obvious things, right? And that is, that is so powerful. You say Puerto Rico. You say Bolivia. Nothing happens. Jamaica. Oh, yeah, Jamaica, right? Double down on that. Right. Focused immigration. It's kind of what I just said. You want to bring in, you know, the great co Silicon Valley is a mess. Anybody been in Silicon Valley in the last year? It is nothing but a parking lot. It is nothing but overpriced housing. It is people are starting to move to Portland. People will move where there's a comfortable way to live. You should have a, uh, an immigration policy that is asking for intelligent, well-educated people to move here. That's how you're going to get ahead, right? And lastly, think you know when 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 when. Sherm when I was asked to come down here and do this, I started thinking about the Caribbean. Think about what's about to happen between now and 2030 with the Caribbean, right? Cuba is opened up to the United States. That's a game changer. Puerto Rico is in bankruptcy. Sea level rise. By the way, when I was talking about the spaceship Earth, here is, a here is a fact you need to know, and I've learned this from my co-author. If all the carbon emissions stopped tomorrow, you know, when this Paris Accord, oh, we all want to reduce it by 2%. If all the carbon emissions stopped tomorrow, we still have 70 years of baked-in warming. In other words, if all the carbon emissions stopped tomorrow, there is a definite, already committed, going to happen, two-foot sea level rise. What's Kingston, Kingston going to look like with a two-foot sea level rise? You know? I mean, it, and, and the, latest, the latest statistics, you know, when I say 2,100 people check out, but the latest statistics from NASA is that there could be a five-foot sea level rise if we don't change our way by 2050. So I am talking to millennials. If you are under the age of 30, by the time you are six, this climate change is the central problem issue opportunity and challenge of the millennial generation. And you have to think about it as an island nation. So uh, welcome to the shift age. We're in it another 20 years. Remember the three forces of the shift age. And welcome to what I think is the greatest age of human transformation in history. Thank you very much. <laughs>